of all four years for a very special discount. Each day of the sale, we will be featuring live videos on our Facebook page, and we are starting things off with a live reading of all 24 books of Homer's Iliad, read by 24 different classical educators. And the remaining five days will be featuring lectures from Old Western culture, and you can decide which ones are streamed. Go to the Roman Roads Curriculum group on Facebook where you can vote in a poll on which lectures will be streaming. Take advantage of great content and great discounts until August 7th. Milton's Paradise Lost is the last great epic in the Western tradition. And we know that he had first intended to write an epic about the Arthurian legend. And Milton thought he could set his sights a little bit higher and write something with a more cosmic scope. And so he decided to write about the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The metaphysical poets came up with what are called conceits, that is analogies or metaphors that are unusual, that even take some work to figure out. They're creative, they're different, they're kind of mind-bending sometimes. Shakespeare has given us a play that shows justice opening up into mercy, the letter of the law being enforced so that mercy can season justice. The British Empire controls something like 75% of the land mass of the planet. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Liberty is all very well, but you cannot talk about whether, whether liberty is good or bad without saying when and for whom. The Romantic movement, a privileged instead of reason, emotion, intuition, imagination as sources for meaning, truth, and significance. The scientific revolution was really a continuation of Plato's project of describing the physical universe with mathematics. But it wasn't until Isaac Newton invented calculus that this Pythagorean Platonic project could really take off. Indeed, Newton was the culmination of the scientific revolution, and he was also the fulfillment of Plato's Pythagorean dream. Reason became the new authority, sometimes above the church, and certainly above Aristotle. And so the scientific revolution of the 1600s sparked the enlightenment of the 1700s, an intellectual movement that has largely shaped our culture today. Dickens deliberately wanted to change people's hearts about how they treated people, and he used Christmas to make people be more sensible and sensitive to those around them. All of her novels are about the doings of people in the countryside and rural areas in England, their relationships, their small concerns, on a small local level, but that's what makes them so delightful and so timeless. One of the reasons this is the most famous chapter in the story is because this sort of encapsulates what may be Dostoevsky's answer, his answer to the problem of evil. The answer doesn't come with our intellectual arguments. Remember what Edmund Burke said about the wisdom that comes from generations upon generations, from a nation or a culture growing slowly over time and developing a wisdom that's greater in its cumulative size than any one human lifetime could ever achieve. Welcome to the fourth day of the Roman Roads Back to School Sale. We are streaming content every day of the sale. The first two days we streamed all 24 books of Homer's Iliad in an epic read aloud. And then yesterday we streamed a lecture from Old Western Culture, the fourth uh, unit of Early Moderns, our fourth year, on uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings by one of our guest lecturers, uh, Dr. Jonathan McIntosh. Today, we will hear another lecture from Early Moderns, except from the first unit, Rise of England, by another guest lecturer, Dr. Peter Lightheart. You can choose which lectures are going to be streamed by joining the Roman Roads Curriculum group on Facebook, and we have a poll there where you can choose which lectures will be streaming for the next two days. Uh, Dr. Peter Lightheart uh, used to uh, teach at New St. Andrews College, where I studied theology under him. He's now president of the Theopolis Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, and is the author of The Brightest Heaven of Invention, 
a guide to six a Christian guide to six Shakespeare plays. So that is a book that I highly recommend and would be a great uh, accompaniment to this lecture, this uh, series, Rise of England from Old Western Culture. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in and enjoy the lecture. Welcome back to Old Western Culture, The Rise of England. Today we'll be looking at a Shakespearean comedy, The Merchant of Venice. The Merchant of Venice is organized in triads. There are three main locations in the story. There are three main plots. There are three main romances. There are three main rescues. There are three caskets in which there's some clue about uh, Portia uh, the hero, heroine of the story, uh, and her future. Let's look at these triads and try to sort through what's going on by looking at the structure of the play, uh, the triple structure that recurs throughout the play. The play is, takes place in three separate locations. The first is Venice itself, as the title indicates. Venice is a commercial city, one of the great commercial cities of the Renaissance era. It was known throughout the world as a center of economic activity, as a place of commerce, of law, of business. And that's the way it's depicted in the play. It's a place of venturing, sending out ships on various trading ventures. It's a place of money lending. It's a place that's ruled by, uh, that's ruled by money and the desire for money and the desire for profit. Outside of Venice is another location known as Belmont. And the name should give you a clue to what kind of place Belmont is. Belmont is a shortened form of beautiful mountain, and it's the palatial home of Portia, the heroine of the story. Belmont is everything that Venice is not. Belmont is a place of music and art. Venice is a place of commerce. Belmont is a place of nighttime. It's a lunar location. Venice is a bustling daytime city. Belmont is a place of grace, and a place of beauty, Venice is a place of law and of contract. In addition to these two locations, we have a third location, this within Venice, and that's the home of Shylock, the Jewish moneylender. This uh, should be seen as a separate location within Venice uh, that has its own distinct identity and its own character in the play. If Belmont is a touch of heaven on earth, and Venice is the city of man. Shylock's home is regularly described as being hellish. It's like hell on earth. In these three locations, Belmont, Venice, and Shylock's home, we have something of a cosmos of heaven and earth and the abyss under the earth. And the action takes place within, uh, within those three locations. These aren't entirely separate locations, as we'll see it's essential for the health of Venice that Belmont invade, that something from Belmont, some of Belmont's beauty and grace touches Venice or else Venice will end up being savage and barbaric. It's important that people be rescued from Shylock's home in order to participate in the life of the city of man and even more in the city of God that's pictured in Belmont. These three locations are uh, the place for three different plots that are sometimes known as 
the casket plot, the bond plot, and the ring plot. The casket plot is centered in Belmont. Portia is a young lady, a beautiful and virtuous young lady, who is uh, lost both her father and her mother. She's left alone as the mistress of Belmont, and she wants to be married. But her father knew that a young woman, wealthily left as she was, with a lot of money and a great estate, uh, would be subject to many suitors. Many suitors would want to get a piece of her, of her estate, if not uh, to have her as a wife. And so her father set up a system for testing the insight and the virtue of the men that would try to court Portia. This is the casket plot. There are three chests that the play calls caskets. I think deliberately uses that word that connotes a place of the dead. Three caskets that are made of three different materials. There's a gold casket, there's a silver casket, there's a lead casket. Each of these caskets has an inscription on it, and the inscription gives a clue about what the contents of the casket uh, is, what the contents of the casket are. Uh, and the suitors who come to Belmont have to choose one of the caskets based on the clue that's inscribed on the casket. If they choose the casket that contains a portrait of Portia, they win Portia and they become heirs to Belmont. If, however, they choose another casket, the wrong casket, then they not only don't get Portia, but they've already taken an oath that they will never marry. It's an all or nothing kind of proposition. They either choose right and get Portia and get Belmont, or they choose wrong and they go home and live a life of singleness forever. The main suitor in the play is Bassanio. Portia has met Bassanio before. She's attracted to him. She wishes that Bassanio would come and participate in the casket test. Bassanio is hesitant to do it. He's in, unable to do it, largely because he lacks funds and he lacks enough, a uh, sufficient amount of wealth to pursue Portia. In order to make a good impression, he would have to have an honor, entourage of servants. He would have to have a whole new wardrobe. He'd have to come in style. You don't come courting a wealthy young woman as a beggar. He has to come looking like he's fit for the position of being master of Belmont. But he doesn't have any cash. He's cash poor. He's in debt in many directions. One of the reasons he's interested in Portia, he's interested in her because of her beauty and her virtue. He's also interested because if he marries Portia, he can pay off all his debts. But he needs money in order to court her. And so he turns to his friend Antonio. Antonio is an older friend, a merchant in Venice. And Antonio is going to provide him with the money that Bassanio needs in order to go to Belmont and participate in the casket test. And this uh, agreement between Bassanio and Antonio gives rise to the second plot, which is known as the bond plot. Bassanio goes to Antonio, I would like to court this woman. This will set me up for life. She's lovely, she's virtuous, but I don't have any money. Can you loan me some money? 3,000 ducats. Antonio is willing to do it, but Antonio has sent out all of his ships. All of his money is tied up in various ventures. All of his ships are out in uh, risky trading ventures, and he doesn't have any cash himself. And so Antonio has to go to the Jewish moneylender Shylock in order to get the money that he needs to loan to Bassanio so that Bassanio can go to Belmont in order to court Portia. Antonio and Shylock have not been on good terms. Antonio despises the Jewish moneylender. Antonio lends money without interest, which uh, uh, interferes with Shylock's business. Shylock's business is to lend money at interest to make his live, livelihood from usury. Uh, and Antonio uh, brings down the, uh, the uh, interest rate by uh, loaning money gratis, by loaning money uh, to, uh, to people without charging interest, and even loaning money to some of Shylock's debtors so they can pay off the debt which uh, prevents Shylock from foreclosing and being able to increase as well. Shylock doesn't like Antonio's business practices. Antonio doesn't like Shylock's religion. And yet they come to an agreement. Shylock will lend 3,000 ducats to Antonio, which he will then pass on to Bassanio, and they sign a contract. And the collateral for the contract is a pound of Antonio's flesh taken from near the heart. 
Shylock proposes this as if it were a joke. He talks about it as kind of lighthearted. Antonio takes up the joke and he says, yes, surely my ships will come back. Some of my ships will come back. I will be able easily to pay off this debt within the, uh, the time period allotted. There's no problem at all for me to pay off the debt. Uh, we'll take this merry, um, this merry agreement, this merry contract. And yes, you can have a pound of my flesh if I default. That's the bond plot. So the, uh, the casket plot, which concerns Portia and her suitors, gives rise to the bond plot, which concerns, uh, the, uh, the, uh, concerns the, the loan that Shylock gives to Antonio, which is then passed on to Bassanio. And the way the structure of the play works as one of these story arcs, as one of the arcs of the, uh, of the narrative, as one of the, one of the arcs of the plot comes to a conclusion, another arc of the plot becomes complicated. So Bassanio takes his money and he courts Portia and he chooses the right casket, surprise, surprise, and he wins Portia. But as soon as he wins Portia, he learns that Antonio's ships have all sunk. Now Antonio cannot, uh, uh, he cannot pay back the loan to Shylock. And Shylock is not in a mood to relent on the contract. He's not in a mood to forgive the loan or to extend the life of the loan. And one of the reasons for this is because his daughter Jessica has been taken from his home with some of his money and taken by a Christian. She's become a Christian and she's married a Christian. Shylock is upset with all of Christian Venice for stealing his daughter who also stole some of his ducats. My daughter, my ducats, my daughter, my ducats. He cries as he wanders through the streets after she leaves his home. She sees it as an escape from hell. He sees it as a theft and a theft by Christians. He insists on the letter of the law. And that again complicates the bond plot that has to be resolved later in a great court scene that we'll look at a little bit later. At the same time, the, the uh, casket plot comes to a conclusion with the engagement and the marriage of Bassanio and, and Portia, another plot begins to uh, emerge, and that's the ring plot. And that ha this has to do with rings that are exchanged, uh, a, a ring that's exchanged, uh, given by Portia to Bassanio. And when she gives him the ring, he promises that he will never take it off, that he won't take it off for anyone, that it, he will die with that ring on. It's a sign of the permanence of their love and the permanence of their marriage. After the courtroom scene, when the bond plot is resolved, the ring plot gets complicated because Bassanio takes off the ring that Portia has given him and gives it to the young lawyer who helped save Antonio in the court scene. The young lawyer, unbeknownst to Bassanio, is Portia in disguise. He doesn't recognize his own wife dressed as a young male jurist. He's actually giving the ring back to Portia, but he doesn't know he is. He gives the ring to the jurist as a thanks as a, as a, uh, to express his gratitude for rescuing Antonio from Shylock's knife. And that, so as the, as the bond plot comes to the end, the ring plot gets complicated. And that is finally resolved at the end of the play uh, when Portia reveals that she was in fact disguised and she was the jurist who saved Antonio's life. And she returns the, the ring uh, again, gives the ring a second time uh, to Bassanio and he swears that he will surely never take it off again. Three locations, three plots, three rescues. There are three times when somebody is rescued from uh, a, uh, uh, some kind of threat, uh, rescued from the dead, rescued from a, a deadly threat. This is where the use of the word casket, I think, is important in Shakespeare's, in the thematics of the play. Shakespeare could have used the word chest, coffer, anything. He uses the word casket, which suggests that Portia's life is dead and buried until a young man comes, a suitor comes, a suitable suitor, to open the right casket and to bring her out from the dead. She actually describes it that way. She's buried in one of the caskets. Bassanio comes as the rescuer. Bassanio comes as the savior who's going to take her out of her casket and give her a new life as a married woman, who's going to take her out of her casket and release her finally from the law of her father and from her singleness. Another rescue takes place in, from Shylock's house. That's a rescue that takes place at, uh, at Belmont. Another rescue takes place uh, at Shylock's house, and this is Jessica, 
Shylock's daughter, who sees her life in Shylock's house as a living hell. She sees her rescue as a kind of exodus. Exodus imagery is used to describe her departure from Shylock's house. She plunders the Egyptian father that she's fleeing from. And she goes and marries a Christian who takes her off to Belmont, off to the beautiful Mount, uh, after she's rescued from uh, this, the hell of Shylock's home. The other rescue is the rescue of Antonio, who is threatened by the bond, who is threatened by Shylock's insistence that the contract be honored by his insistence that he get his pound of flesh no matter what. One of the interesting twists of The Merchant of Venice uh, is that the different dynamics of Shakespearean comedy are present within a single play. At the beginning of this series of lectures, we saw that Shakespearean comedy is based on a belief that human beings are able to create chaos in their lives. They are able to create a mess. They're incapable of solving it, but there is a power, there is some power beyond human control that can intervene. There is some grace operative in the world that can put the world back together after we've messed it up. And that grace takes the form, as we saw at the beginning of this series, of either exodus or invasion, exodus or incarnation. And in Merchant of Venice, we actually have both of those plot dynamics go on with different characters. Jessica very explicitly and very literally embarks on an exodus. She escapes from a uh, from an obstacle. Uh, she escapes an obstacle to her desire. She wants to marry Lorenzo. She wants to become a Christian. She escapes by fleeing her father's house, and she goes into the golden world of Belmont, and there she finds new life. On the other hand, Portia needs an invasion. She's under her father's rule. Uh, suitable suitors have not showed up. Bassanio has finally come, and Bassanio invades this situation, releases her from her casket, releases her from the law of her father. He invades, he incarnates himself into Belmont so that Belmont, there's a resurrection of Portia that takes place in Belmont. The interesting dynamic in this play is that the rescued becomes the rescuer. As soon as Portia is rescued from her casket, she in turn disguises herself and goes to rescue Antonio uh, disguised as a jurist uh, in Venice. She's been rescued by, uh, by Bassanio. Now she goes to rescue Bassanio's friend. Those two events take place right after each other. Uh, the, the rescued becomes the rescuer in this play. There are also three romances in Merchant of Venice. I've mentioned uh, two of them, Lorenzo and Jessica. Jessica, again, is Shylock's daughter. Lorenzo is a Christian uh, suitor who rescues her from her father's house and marries her. There's Portia and Bassanio. And the third, uh, the third uh, uh, romance is uh, uh, Bassanio's friend Graziano, who accompanies him to Belmont and falls in love with Portia's maid, Nerissa. So there's a double wedding that takes place at Belmont. There's Bassanio and Portia, there's Gratiano and Nerissa. Nerissa. Those, those three uh, romances also make, uh, are one of the triads of the play. We can see some other dimensions of this when we pay closer attention to the caskets, but I want to just talk about that for a few minutes before returning to this triple structure that we find throughout, throughout the play. As I mentioned, there are three caskets. Each of them bears an inscription. Each of them is made of a different metal. There's a gold casket, a silver casket, and a lead casket. The gold casket bears this inscription. Who chooses me shall gain what many men desire. The silver casket bears this inscription. Who chooses me shall get as much as he deserves. The lead casket bears this inscription. Who chooses me must give and hazard all he has. Several characters, several suitors are uh, shown choosing among the caskets. The first is uh, the Prince of Morocco. And he comes and he looks at those different inscriptions and he says, what many men desire. Many men desire Portia. Portia must be in that casket. He opens the gold casket and reads an inscription. It reads a message that says, all that glitters is not gold. Your suit is cold. Go home and never marry again and he goes home crestfallen. The Prince of Aragon comes. Uh, 
Portia and Nerissa make fun of many of the suitors. They make fun of the Prince of Aragon. And he's quite, uh, quite proud of himself. And he looks at the silver casket. Who chooses me will get what he deserves. Why? I merit the best. I deserve the best. I deserve the best wife. I deserve the best life. That's me. Portia must be in there. I deserve her. But he opens the casket and, of course, finds that Portia is not there. The inscriptions on the casket are describing different visions of what love is. Is love desire? Is love about getting what many men desire or getting what you desire? Is love about merit or desert? Do you love somebody because they merit your love? Bassanio is more insightful. And this, again, shows the wisdom within the kind of fairy tale world of the play. It shows the wisdom of Portia's father. Only someone like Bassanio, who has some insight into the nature of the world and can see past exterior exteriors and penetrate to the essence of things. Only a character like that, only a man like that, deserves Portia. And Bassanio is that man. He looks at the lead casket and he sees uh, not something frightening, but he sees a comment on the nature of the world. The Prince of Morocco says, I'm not going to choose the lead casket. Give and hazard everything for lead? Never! The Prince of Aragon does the same, but Bassanio sees that and embarks on a meditation on, uh, on uh, uh, appearances and reality. This is taken from Act 3, Scene 2 of The Merchant of Venice. This is a speech by Bassanio uh, as he's standing before the caskets trying to decide which one to open. So may the outward shows be least themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament, with exteriors. And then he goes to explain, so give some examples of how the world is deceived, misled by ornament. In law, what plea so tainted and corrupt, but being seasoned with a gracious voice obscures the show of evil? In religion, what damned error but some sober brow will bless it and approve it with a text, hiding the grossness with fair ornament. There is no vice so simple, but assumes some mark of virtue on his outward parts. How many cowards whose hearts are all as false as stairs of sand wear yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars, who inward searched have livers white as milk. And these assume but valor's excrement to render them redoubted. Look on beauty, and you shall see this purchase, tis purchased by the weight. I guess there was a market in cosmetics in Shakespeare's day. Beauty is purchased by the weight, which therein works a miracle in nature, making them lightest that wear the most of it, lightening their complexion. So are those crisp, snaky, golden locks, which make such wanton gambles with the wind upon supposed fairness, often known to be the dowry of a second head. Women wear wigs so that their hair looks more beautiful than it actually is. It's the dowry of a second head, the skull that bred them in the sepulchre. Thus, ornament is but the guiled shore to a most dangerous sea, the beauteous scarf veiling an Indian beauty. In a word, the seeming truth which cunning times put on to entrap the wisest. Therefore, he says, thou gaudy gold, hard food from Midas, I will none of thee. He rejects the gold casket. Nor none of thee, silver casket, thou pale and common drudge between man and man. But thou, thou meager lead, which rather threatens than does promise aught, thy paleness moves me more than eloquence, and here I choose. Joy be the consequence. He understands that the external appearance doesn't tell you what's inside. You can't judge a book by the cover. You can't judge the contents of a casket by the kind of metal that it's made of. He knows that gold can cover death. He knows that silver is the common drudge between man and man. It's what coins are made of. And he sees in the lead casket, not only, uh, not only sees past the appearance, but he sees in this inscription on the lead casket, a challenge to true love. Love is not about getting what you desire. Love is not about getting what you deserve. Love instead is about giving, about uh, risking and hazarding all. Bassanio proves himself to be a worthy suitor to Portia because he recognizes the nature of love. One of the interesting twists in the play is the way that, that those three inscriptions 
also function as three different visions, not only of love, but of commerce. Venice is a place where gold is the, it's, it's a place of gold. It's where men pursue what they desire. Shylock's house is a place of merit and desert where everyone gets exact justice, exactly what they deserve to the letter of the law. He's a stereotypical or caricature of a Jew who's insisting on the letter of the law. His house is like the silver casket. But Belmont is a place of lead. As golden as it is on the outside, its essence is what the, lead, the inscription on the lead casket indicates. This is where, this is a community of people that give and hazard all they have. And even the best of the, uh, the best of the businessmen, the merchants in Venice, act on that same principle in their commercial activity, as well as in the romance, uh, their romances. The true merchant, Antonio, for example, is one who hazards his goods on the high seas with great trading ventures. Shylock plays it safe. Shylock uses money to make money, doesn't venture anything. He has guaranteed returns. He's not venturing and hazarding all he has. He gets exactly what he deserves. One of the interesting twists of the play is to uh, connect these two realms of life, romance and commerce, and to show that the same principle is really operative in both. In both, the demand is to risk and hazard all you have. And these three caskets, these three caskets and the three inscriptions on them line up with the three, as I've already suggested, with the three different locations that, uh, in, that are uh, structure the play. Belmont is a place that's characterized by uh, the, uh, the inscription on the lead. Venice is a place of gold. Shylock's house is a place of silver. Let me turn in conclusion to talk about the, uh, the Bond plot in particular and about Shylock, who is uh, the most, most famous or infamous character in the play. The play depicts Shylock as a villain. His house is like hell. He himself is described as being like a fiend. He wants to kill a member, a citizen of Venice. He wants to cut out a pound of flesh from near his heart in order to secure or in order to be repaid for his contract. Um, the, the, the way that the imagery that surrounds him is all fiendish, monstrous, devilish imagery. Uh, recent productions have found it difficult to portray Shylock in this manner. Uh, especially since World War II and the Holocaust, productions have tried to soften the way that Shylock is portrayed in the play. And often Shylock is portrayed in contemporary productions as a pitiable character, one who's a victim of the Christian characters, one whose forced conversion at the end of the play is a tragedy. In a recent film version, the last shot of, the, of this film is a picture of Jessica standing in Belmont looking wistfully back toward Venice, as if she were wishing she had never left her father's house. Another late shot in that film is a shot of Shylock standing out of a synagogue. He's been forced to convert to Christianity and the doors of the synagogue close as the service begins. He's been closed out of his own community. And the end of the play is uh, uh, something of a tragedy for Shylock, or at least pathetic for Shylock. You're supposed to sympathize with him. I think at the Elizabethan stage, the effect would have been quite different. Elizabethans, many of them, believe that Romans 9 through 11, a prophecy in Paul's writings that talk about the conversion of the Jews, was a, was a, was a promise that was still to be fulfilled. They thought that the conversion of the Jews was going to happen in the future and it was going to cause a great international revival and usher in the millennium. That would be the great last event before the last days begin. For an Elizabethan audience, the conversion of the Jew from Judaism to Christianity is actually a rescue of Shylock. He's rescued from the law and brought into the realm of grace. But the play does, uh, the play does portray him throughout as a villain. And it's important to see how the, uh, the, the bond plot is resolved and what kind of crisis it uh, creates for Venice. Again, the bond plot has to do with the contract that Shylock and Antonio make uh, regarding the loan that Shylock makes to Antonio. He makes an, a loan of 3,000 ducats to be repaid within a certain period of time. And the collateral 
or the, 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 uh, what uh, Antonio would pay if he defaults on the loan is a pound of flesh that Shylock would be able to take from his breast. Uh, that creates a crisis, not just for Antonio, obviously. He's now threatened with having a pound of flesh removed, but it creates a crisis for Venice. What is Venice to do? On the one hand, the Duke of Venice could say, that contract is null and void. We are not going to honor that contract because it would involve the death of one of our citizens. But as Shylock insists, that would undermine Venice's entire being and the entire, their entire commercial empire. If you can't honor, if Venice won't honor a contract voluntarily signed and entered into by two people, two residents of Venice, then Venice's law is a joke. Nobody's going to do commerce with Venice. Nobody's going to do business with Venice after that. You can't rely on the law. Shylock knows that he has the Duke of Venice over a barrel. He knows that he's got this wild card to play, that Venice itself is threatened. But what happens if Venice allows Shylock to get his, his payment, his repayment, his pound of flesh? That doesn't look like a good option either, obviously, because then Venice would be condoning murder. That's the dilemma that's set up by the, uh, by the, uh, the bond plot and Shylock's insistence on the letter of the law, the letter of the contract. And it's important to see exactly how this is resolved in the great trial scene that takes place in Act Four. Portia makes in the Portia comes disguised as a jurist in order to rescue Antonio and to break uh, break uh, uh, break this logjam that Venice is in, uh, and she makes a beautiful speech about mercy. She tries to convince Shylock to relent, to show mercy to Antonio, to give up his insistence on the letter of his contract. And she says this, uh, one of the famous speeches of the play. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives it, him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It's enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute of God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow, this strict court of Venice must needs give a sentence against this merchant here. She tries to convince Shylock to show mercy by talking about mercy as a, an attribute of God himself. She reminds him of the Lord's Prayer, which of course Shylock, being a Jew, has never prayed. She says that mercy must season justice. That's when earthly power is most like the power of God, not when strict justice is enforced, but when mercy seasons justice. But this doesn't convince Shylock. By what compulsion must I show mercy, he asks. Nobody can make me show mercy, and Portia agrees. Bassanio is there in the court, and he says to the duke, ignore this contract. Do a little wrong to accomplish a greater right. Overturn a valid contract. Overturn the law at this small point so that you can make, uh, so you can establish justice. And Portia says, it must not be. The contract must be honored. The law must be upheld. This speech doesn't convince Shylock. Her pleas for mercy don't convince Shylock. What finally turns the tables on Shylock is that he gets trapped in his own insistence on the law. I stand here for law, he says. I stand here for the bond. Portia asks, do you have a surgeon present to stop the bleeding in, in case he starts bleeding to death? Shylock says, is it in the contract? It's not in the contract. I'm not bound by it. He insists on the letter of the law. In open court, he refuses twice, three times, 30 times his original loan. 
He doesn't want money back. He wants his pound of flesh. And he gets his knife and is ready to cut. The Duke of Venice has given him permission. Portia has argued in favor of the contract. And just as he's about to cut into Antonio's breast, she says, but soft. This contract, this bond, gives you not one jot of blood. Take your pound of flesh. But if you shed one drop of Venetian blood, then you come under the condemnation of the law as a murderer. It's in the contract. There is no blood mentioned in the contract. Portia traps Shylock by insisting on the letter of the law even more strictly than Shylock the Jew. She doesn't bring mercy by dismissing the law. She doesn't bring mercy by getting rid of the law. She brings mercy by insisting on the enforcement of the very letter of the law. I think Merchant of Venice is a deeply Protestant play in all kinds of ways, but especially here, a a deeply Pauline play. When Paul asks the question, do we negate the law by the gospel? He says, no, never. May it never be. Meganoito in the Greek. No, we establish the law. Redemption doesn't come by God ignoring the law, but by God enforcing the law, even enforcing the punishment of the law on his own son. And we have a reflex of that kind of gospel in the play. Shakespeare has brilliantly set up this final trial scene so that the letter of the law is enforced. But the letter of the law is enforced in a way that opens up the possibility for mercy and opens up the salvation of Antonio from Shylock and uh, for an Elizabethan audience, the salvation of Shylock by bringing him out of Judaism into the Christian church. I think you could summarize the message of this trial scene and of much of the thrust of Merchant of Venice with Paul's statement that God is both the just, both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Shakespeare has given us a play that shows justice opening up into mercy, the letter of the law being enforced so that mercy can season justice. Thank you. To prepare for the next lecture, uh, read John Donne's Valediction uh, Forbidding Morning, uh, the two holy sonnets 10 and 14, and then Meditation 17. <clears throat> uh, in the Valediction Forbidding Morning, uh, look for the things that, uh, uh, that suggest the metaphysical aspect of, uh, of Donne. Remember, he's called a metaphysical poet because he looks for, uh, he tries for metaphors or analogies or, uh, or parallels that are uh, kind of startling. Uh, and there's a very startling one in this. Look to see what, uh, what, what that is and how it uh, enforces the point of the poem. In the sonnets, uh, look at the sonnet form. Uh, see if you can figure out what kind of sonnet is, rem- it is. Remember that the rhyme scheme uh, can tell you what sort of sonnet it is. Uh, and look how the thought that's developed in the sonnet uh, parallels the sections defined by the rhyme schemes. We'll talk about that when we get to the sonnet. Uh, and finally, and maybe most importantly, uh, in the meditation uh, number 17, uh, look to see what, uh, uh, what uh, extended metaphor John Donne is using in that. Um, uh, uh, it, is a, it is a meditation on death, but look to see how he treats death and how, th- how he thinks we as Christians ought to think of death. It's a very powerful essay, and it's got some famous lines in it too, so uh, you may pick up on those as you're reading. <laughs>